evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, having seen that video, um, not for the first time, it still just gives me absolute goosebumps and makes me so proud to be a member of the Black Management Forum, which is clearly still such a leader in society and playing such a pivotal role in terms of the socio-economic transformation of the country and of the economy. So with that, <laughs> welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this year's first installment of the BMF's CEO's Conversation Series. Just to tell you a bit about the series itself, um, the CEO's Conversation Series is a platform for business leaders to gather several times a year to hear from a variety of visionary CEOs and business leaders on topics affecting their organizations, their industries, and the country at large. So tonight's topic, um, a CEO's perspective on the challenges of the auditing industry. Um, and I have with me two of probably the most appropriate guests for this topic, the CEOs of Deloitte South Africa as well, sorry, Deloitte <laughs> Africa and um, KPMG South Africa. Um, and they will really journey with us through how the issues which hit the profession about three years ago, and we'll go into them, how they impacted um, their organizations, um, the industry at large, and really how they have steered their organizations and the industry back to uh, regaining public confidence and, and credibility. Um, but before I say a lot, um, I would like to welcome the president of the Black Management Forum, Mr. Andy Lenomlala, to welcome all our guests this evening. Uh, over to you, President. Uh, good evening, uh, and thanks, Setu, for such a warm welcome. Uh, let me first uh, greet everybody that has attended uh, tonight's session. And I will start uh, with greeting our guests, uh, Mr. Ignatius and Loazi. Both uh, uh, CEOs uh, tonight are quite uh, uh, dependable uh, corporate members of BMF. Uh, we are very grateful that they are giving us their time. And I understand that both organizations coincidentally have been at the core phase of uh, some of the questionable uh, work that has been done in the auditing profession. I hope uh, this evening they will put themselves out and uh, actually assure the, the, the South African public that uh, uh, their companies and organizations have uh, since uh, corrected their ways. Let me perhaps uh, continue to greet my, my deputy president in the BMF and the rest of my colleagues in the BMF board. Uh, I must also welcome our sister organization, Abasa. Uh, Ashley is part of us tonight and his colleagues. And we are starting to work very closely with Abasa and we look forward as black professionals to align ourselves so that we don't speak in multiple voices, but to actually be more concentrated and focused in our advocacy work that we do. I must also greet the colleagues at All Mutual, uh, one of our corporate partners. They are led by their own uh, MD of uh, Wealth and Investment, Mr. Kaya Gowoto. We say welcome, Kaya, and your team. I must also greet the ex team members of, of Sanam, uh, led by Sydney Mbele. Uh, I must also quickly move the Woolworths uh, ex team. All these uh, corporate members of PMF that have been looking forward to join this session. And lastly, but not least, I must welcome the expo team of uh, Vodacom. And I must immediately do say that uh, <clears throat> I greet the standards of the BMF this evening, and we are led by, and they are led by the chairman coincidentally of uh, KPMG, uh, President Wiseman Good, who we say welcome home and thank you for giving us your CEO tonight. And I must also greet uh, the CEO of uh, PwC Southern Africa, Shelly Mashaba. Uh, before I, I, I say any further words, uh, uh, SA2 and to you colleagues, I must say that uh, as the organization, we feel very humbled by the opportunity that once in a while during these tough times, we have access and we can have the opportunity to engage one of our, or many of our highly notable figures in our country, and uh, Deloitte in particular, we have 
worked with them over the years. We were looking forward uh, up until the COVID uh, disrupted our plans to set up a, a big session when Deloitte was opening their offices uh, in, in Waterfall. I'm sure that hasn't happened. I hope that at some point in time we will get the opportunity. Uh, from the BMF, uh, we want to say this, and, and I want to put it in context uh, without taking much time, that we see uh, in the country and, and quite astonishing behaviors that are taking place where the sense of uh, people wanting or people subjecting themselves to the scrutiny of the public uh, when it comes to their actions and ethics has become a, a, a sort of a moment's task that now our constitution uh, and our constitutional court rulings are becoming uh, questionable and not questionable because they don't have a standing, are questionable because the figures quite notable figures in our country are starting to undermine their authority. And there can be no justification. I, I, I don't care how many, how much one has and how many excuses one have, but the minute and the day we would run a country uh, with a, a brass band of uh, disrespect and, and ignoring the authority, that is the rule of law that is that is embedded in our constitution, then you must know that we are uh, heading into a cliff. But I want to bring it to corporate South Africa to say, <clears throat> it's funny that you would find that people are only agitated when it's politicians that are doing these things. And we know what the politicians have taken our country, particularly in the last, couple of years during the state catch up period. But a, a soft uh, picture of that is happening in, 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 in the private sector. The rule of law that demands compliance when it comes to affirmative action, uh, employment equity, and the Black Economic Empowerment Act doesn't prevail in the private sector. Now, there is no legitimacy that the private sector can stand and say, we are law-abiding corporate citizens. When we know and when we see that their own actions have been questionable when it comes to us building a united non-racial democratic South Africa. Many people undermine this. The lack of transformation in private sector, and I always insist on saying it, is an unpatriotism action of, of proportions that are unimaginable. The dream, the vision, the future of this country lies, and we have seen it in many occasions when we hosted the World Cup. We have seen it when Rasia Rasmus led the Spring Cup team into a World Cup victory in 2019 that the potential of our country and the strength of our country lies in us being able to work together. It lies in us exploring our diversity for our own advantage. The exclusion of the marginalized and the majority of, of people into the economic levers of our country tells you that it, it weakens our country. It kills the potential and standing of our country. And private sector, no one ever gets to school because they are able quite conveniently in the last 10 years to only point fingers to the opposite end, which was justified. And I'm not trying to exonerate the, the, the explicit, the blatant, levels of corruption that we have experienced. Now, to prove that the work that is happening in the, the deliberate exclusion of people in private sector, the deliberate overlooking in terms of complying with the laws of our country, creates an opportunity that whenever is convenient, 
you mustn't look at KPMG, who is who was deeply linked to the state capture. You must look at the corporates and the corporations that were part and parcel of that state capture, were linked deeply in that state capture. It's credible international companies and local companies. But when you look at the Zondo Commission, and I know that they haven't yet gone to testify there, but when you look at the commission, there is an overemphasis on individuals that I don't say they must not be scolded or brought to book, but you can't have a scale of corruption that has happened in the state capture period just being orchestrated by individuals. There were banks that these people were depositing these uh, stolen monies. There were auditors that were hiding and, and justifying some of the actions. There were consultants, there were firms, law firms that orchestrated some of these instruments. And we are busy going to end up with a situation where we don't correct the bigger systemic problem, but will only be limited to us trying to use individuals and justify that we have dealt with corruption when we arrest one or two people. It's not going to happen. Corruption is a moral issue. And a moral issue cannot be excluded from which levels of morals that must apply or not. If you are running a corporate and you know that you don't adhere to the South African rules, to the South African dream of building a non-racial society and creating opportunities for all of us, not a selected racial grouping, then you must know that you are not better than an individual of the state capture. We might arrest that individual of the state capture, but we will still be left with you. The person that doesn't buy into a Mandela's vision that he spent 27 years in jail for. And as a result, we will always deal with symptoms rather than to address the root cause of our problem. Our economic challenges now the stagnation, the lack of growth. And many other people are referring it or deferring it to structural reforms and every other economic term that one can use. But the basic issue about the South African problems is that there is too few people who are actively participating in the productive capacity of our state by virtue of the rest of the others who are just merely reduced as consumers on a social grant stipend. Now, if we don't produce not just goods and services that we need, but goods and services that we can export to the maximum and proportions that we need, we will never address the deficiency that we have in our, in our GDP. No matter how much of the structural reforms that we can have, no matter how much we can trim the public service, some who argue is polluted. But the day you take one employee from the functioning of uh, uh, his or her responsibility in the state, is the day you reduce or condemn 15 other black people into abject poverty immediately. No one has made an assessment of how bloated are we compared to our productive capacity in the state? And how equipped are government employees to be functionaries that can create an enabling economy that can make us entrepreneurs? of enabling the economy to function. So all of those, we, we can pinpoint it to KPMG, we can pinpoint it to Deloitte in some instances, but it doesn't help us to address uniformly the approach that post the state capture period. And, and the other thing I must address before I, I sit down, uh, SAP, is that 
There is another bigger mistake that we experience as the BMF leadership where when we meet with state institutions that were engulfed by corruption of state capture proportion. Uh, to date, after there has been change of guard, whether it's leadership or not, uh, and boards and executives, all those people, what they are doing, are obsessed with searching the dead bodies of the state capture period. They are not setting their minds that, well, we would look at the corruption that has happened, but at the same time, we need to take these institutions into another correct path. They must play their role of being developmental, of being an impetus in our economy. Instead, as a CEO, you focusing on who was corrupt and how many times were those people corrupt. Of course they were, and they must be dealt with. I'm not saying that they must not be dealt with, but we can't run a country and make it functional because we are busy looking for, for criminals. The criminals must be apprehended and they must be sent to jail. But as the new leadership come in, we need a state that is functioning, a state that has been stifled by a, a double jeopardy of the COVID-19 and even the downgrading that took place. I can tell you colleagues that with the state institutions that we meet with, only Transnet, has set foot solidly under the leadership of Porsche to lead and take the business to a right track so that it can function. We are not saying that Transnet was not battered by, by state capture, but there has been a clear guideline and a clear visionary leadership there to set the business back on track without necessarily being over uh, elusive about trying wrong when was wrong. If you are leading now, you must lead and create an opportunity for the institutions to be functional. And then at the same time, allow law enforcement uh, agencies to deal with the problems that we have. So the problem, we can't sit as a country and allow the, 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 the ruling party, for instance, to spend weekends and week hours trying to address their own internal legitimacy issues, clean up, they are necessary, but the same people that sits on weekends discussing crooked individuals are supposed to run the country and the students don't have funding, the economy is at the worst levels ever, and all we hear and all we rely on is who is going to step aside tomorrow, who mustn't step aside the other day. They must deal with each other's moral issues and their problems. Collectively, we must get the country back on track. We can't run a country by introspection. We need vision. We need direction. We need leadership that can take us forward. And with those few words, I say to, to the two uh, CEOs that are joining us this evening that, and I know with you, Ignatius, that you have since moved beyond your problems. Your organization is now stabilizing. Your organization is now taking on new jobs. All we want was you deal with the ropes that you had within your system or you have done that. But all we want is that assure us that you wouldn't be party going forward to legitimizing crooked and corrupt people. And there are many other professions, the legal firms haven't yet been brought into exposure, but we know, we listen to professionals that the legal firms used legal opinions that were arming the boards, the rogue boards to fire CEOs that were withstanding the pressure. We know that. We know that the banks, it's only net bank that is being made to account, but all the banks in South Africa received strange account amounts of monies to people's accounts who have never had a track record of being in business. How do you justify a deposit of 170 million in one person's account? Six hours later, that 170 million has been dispersed and the bank doesn't say anything. Where are the checks and balances that
that comes from those institutions. And people are happy to hide behind those that they are exposed and point fingers. Instead of all of us focusing on putting back on track our country. It can't be President Cyril Ramaphosa's responsibility alone, especially in the environment of his political party that he's living in. It's actually almost an impossibility for him to save our country. But the private sector must come to the fore to help build the nation. And it starts with them transforming, giving capable, able, experienced, educated black professionals positions of responsibility so that all of us and all of us united in our diversity can build a prosperous country. Uh, thank, thank you, Essay. Thank you very much, um, President. And um, I expected nothing less from you than to really look at a political uh, perspective um, at a macro level, at a country level, and even to place the conversation that we're having today and to place the industry within that um, macroeconomic and geopolitical um, aspect and, and remind all of us around the table of the responsibilities that we have as individuals, as organizations and as industries. Um, so thank you very much um, to the BMF president, Mr. Andele Mumlala. So colleagues, before our guests come in, allow me to take it to a industry level um, since we are discussing the audit industry this evening. So uh, let's not sweep things under the carpet or beat around the bush. Uh, I'm sure everybody understands that the context of you know, conversations like this one really uh, throw us back to 2017. Uh, where we had uh, the KPMG, I'll call it a corporate failure. I wanted to say scandal, but I'm going to be PC. <laughs> um, where the KPMG uh, 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 issues came to the fore, um, burst into the media, um, especially because they were linked to uh, the Guptas and, and state capture. And at that time, um, that that whole web was, was being unraveled. And it was obviously a shock to everybody that you could have an audit firm like KPMG linked um, to, 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 the, uh, to, the, to the activities that were happening at KPMG. Um, I think that was around September 2017. Lo and behold, comes December 2017, and uh, Steinoff happens. Um, and, and, and once again, um, you see a, 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 a trusted, uh, audit firm, um, part of the big four, as they're colloquially called, um, Deloitte, um, being, uh, you know, as the auditors of Steinhoff um, at a global level and, and, and as well as at, at a local level. Um, and then in March 2019, KPMG and Deloitte again come under fire as the quality of their audit work is is questioned um, in relation to the corporate failure at Tonga Hewlett. Um, so colleagues, in a very short space of time, um, we had almost three successive quite, quite significant um, uh, issues or scandals um, coming to the fore involving um, these, these audit firms. And I think from a profession that really trades, whose business model is really based upon trust um, and based upon um, people placing such a high level of assurance, they're almost the last line of defense um, to the corporate world uh, at large, to investors, to shareholders, to, to all stakeholders really. And when this happened, I think it really shook the industry. I mean, the last time that something like this happened was back in 2001, I think, with the collapse of um, Arthur Anderson and, and the Enron scandal. And once again, we were brought to the questions that say, okay, we have had this number of corporate failures with these um, very much um, trusted um, audit firms. Um, what really is the role of an auditor when they are auditing? Do they have a role to detect fraud? Um, you would find auditors saying, well, that's not our job. Our job is really to give a reasonable level of assurance and to a large extent, we rely on what the executive management um, tells us. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, auditors are required to exercise professional skepticism and not to overlook 
um, what, what seems to be, you know, gross areas of either conflicts of interest or missing uh, billions in, in financials that cannot be accounted for. And so the conversation started all over again. What is the role of the auditors? What is the role of other stakeholders um, in, in, in the system in, in providing this level of assurance? And really, what needs to be done um, to fix the profession, both at a systemic level and in terms of the audit processes and procedures which, which, which auditors provide, really to prevent um, such uh, corporate failures from, from occurring um, and, 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 and really to make people understand what the role of the auditors really are. So, <laughs> with the greatest of respect for all the confidentiality that the two CEOs uh, might, might have, um, they, they, they may not refer to specifics, but we really invite you, colleagues, um, to speak to us about what the role of the auditors is, what has been done to fix the profession from the time of um, 2017 um, up to now. Um, some have suggested that auditing firms should not be allowed to provide both auditing services as well as all the other consultancy and advisory services to the same client um, because this has been seen to, to compromise their independence and some people um, have written that this is at the root cause of what we've seen. So with that context in mind, um, <laughs> I would like to introduce um, uh, KPMG SA CEO, uh, Oput Ignatius Sebule. Um, I had prepared your whole CV by Ignatius, but actually, I, I think I'm just going <laughs> to I'm just going to let you um, uh, speak. Um, how are we going to do it is we first going to have Oput Ignatius um, just giving us um, a context of Where's the industry? What has transpired over the past three or so years as the leaders of these organizations? What have they experienced from the inside? And what are they really doing to restore the trust and credibility of this very proud um, uh, profession? Uh, for Ignatius, um, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, SA2, and good evening to all of the guests. Um, SA2, in your earlier introduction, uh, you asked the question, what are these, the challenges that the industry has faced? You asked, what, what have they taken away from the industry? And in your introduction now, you sort of answered it by saying that uh, all of these corporate failures uh, started making sure that the trust that was there in the industry um, became eroded. Now, you know, some of you might know that I, I, I spent uh, quite uh, a number of years uh, in, at the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants working for this profession, which I loved yet. And every chartered accountant that qualified in that time would have heard me give the speech over and over again that one of the basic strong pillars of the profession is integrity and high levels of unassailable ethics. And that remains the cornerstone of, of, of the profession. And without that, the, there won't be any, any, any profession, quite frankly. Um, the, the challenges that we've had are, are well known locally, internationally. And there's been quite a number of commissions and studies and you know, groups of people examining what is it that cause, that continue to cause corporate collapses and how it can be fixed. Now, um, in, in South Africa, we've had our own, own, own debates and uh, we've uh, frequently referred to the UK and a lot of 
the studies that have been done there, we've been talking about them. Uh, and that's much aligned to what was in the EU. With Brexit now, uh, the, the UK is busy as a government project, actually see, see, looking at what needs to change, what regulations needs to be introduced, and what the financial markets needs to look like from the regulation point of view going forward. Uh, and I think the EU is gonna follow hot on the heels because there is now competition between the two as to where the money is gonna be the safest and each one would like to claim that. Now, another part of the world that is a whole huge economy on its own and hardly ever looks at what the rest of the world does uh, is, is the US and they can afford to do that because it's all the size of the economy that they are. Uh, but even with them, they're beginning to look elsewhere. Because if you remember after, after Enron, they came Sabine Oxley, uh, which was US specific. That did not fix the problem because in 2008, there was a financial crisis, your Lehman Brothers and, and, and that. And thereafter, for the first time, the US started talking to the rest of the world and say, maybe uh, FASB, which is their Financial Accounting Standards Board, can start work working with the ASB to close the gap between uh, account, uh, US GAAP and RFRS. And that gap has been closing uh, continuously that uh, the standards are virtually uh, the same now. But even that, the problem uh, doesn't go away. And they've done, I think it was uh, like last year sometime, another analysis of what they think uh, the issues might be. And I'm just touching on what the US has found because I know we talk a lot about uh, what we think here and in the UK uh, slash uh, Europe. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring in uh, other parts of the world as, 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 as we go along. Now, the first that they found uh, in, in, in their study was that uh, there's poor audit quality. And they believe that uh, the audit quality is a problem all around. And when the regulators got together, uh, they convinced the other regulators from around the world that this is, this is the problem. Uh, because you just need to look at the results of the inspection reports of the regulators around the world and you will see that the level of compliance with standards, that is auditing standards, is very low. Now, if you look at the absolute numbers that they report, including here in South Africa, uh, that seems to be the case. It might even be the case. However, what all of these regulators have in common uh, and whether it's an issue of budget on their side or not, I don't know, and I wouldn't have thought that a regulator like the US has issues uh, on budget. But something that they're very uh, similar, with the US less so than others, uh, but including in South Africa, I was talking to one of the uh, big four CEOs, I think it was like towards the end of last year, so and he was very furious because he just had an inspection uh, from our regulator. And out of the thousands and thousands of uh, files that they had, the regulator chose six files. And found, I can't remember what the numbers were. Let's, let's say uh, two were okay and four had issues. And therefore, that, those are the percentages that go out there to say uh, that there's this much non-compliance in this particular set. 
And later on, they get aggregated. There's this much compliance in these firms, and there's this much non-compliance in the country. And the issue is when you look from the audit point of view, you know, we used as auditors used to build a technique that's called the uh, statistical sampling, where you scientifically calculate a sample that you pick and then inspect and then make a projection based on that sample. If you didn't find anything wrong to say, the whole population is free of error. Now, with all due respect to statistics, we know that doesn't work. It's been proven by the results over and over again. But it's worse when you only pick six files that you try and then make a conclusion. Be that as it may, from the audit point of view, when the regulators come and do the inspection, you do not want one file failing. And when I was at SAC, I used to talk to firms and they'd say, yeah, but it's impossible. I mean, there'll be one bad file there. I, I still now, that is me at the head of an audit firm. I still don't accept that. The quality of education in the audit profession and the training that, that, that gets given I would submit it's still a very excellent level. And that is why there's a lot of excellence in this profession. Let me also hasten to remind you that for about, I think it was four or five years run, we were voted as a profession by the World Economic Forum, number one in the world. That did not come by accident. I also want to submit that a lot of these corporate failures, it is very rare when you go and look where you'd find that the auditors did not know. It does happen, but it's rare. So in my view, the level of competency is there. So if the level of competence is there, what's missing? For me, it's the orientation of the auditor. It is how you actually deal with this situation. How skeptical are you? How freely accepting of management's explanations are you? Because you really have to be skeptical. Yes, on the other hand, let's not fool ourselves. There are very complex areas of estimates and valuations. In particular, the longer the period of estimate is, the more fuzzy it becomes. And therefore, judgment plays a role. And anybody can make a mistake. Uh, in, that, in that regard. But there's some times where we ignore what the current situation is telling us about the environment, about the economy, and why is this client of mine different and not being impacted to the same extent with the other industry players? There may be a good reason, but it's worth a check. And then you can document in your audit file as to why you've done about it and what you find, what you found the reasons to be, and why you think that's reasonable. And then that's fine because then your audit file will stand alone and will actually follow through the logic. But often that level of skepticism is missing. And then there are instances few as well, but there are instances where the auditor actually knew that something was wrong. And for reasons best known to them, they chose to ignore. And that is a pity. 
And that's one of those things that severely bring disrepute to our profession. The only currency that we have, reputation. The only currency that we have, integrity. I still believe, by the way, don't get me wrong, I still believe that the overwhelming majority of chartered accountants in this country are very honest, are very ethical, and are people of upstanding morals and integrity. But you see, to lose reputation, you don't need many people. Two or three is enough. It ruins everybody's reputation. Two or three is enough. It takes everybody down. And that is why, that is one thing. And unfortunately, you know, I always say even when I talk to the students, they say, you know, we haven't invented uh, a thermometer like thing where you just put now the, like these kind of guns that are being used to check temperatures because of COVID, where you can just put it on Ignatius's forehead or arm or anywhere and read whether he's a person of integrity or not. And therefore it becomes very difficult to deal and root, root that out. Now, the other things that they've put as causes is lack of independence. And they believe that in, in audit firms, audit partners need to keep their annuity uh, income, otherwise they have negative consequences on their career. That's what they find. And they also uh, lamenting on an issue where the auditor seeks to grow the revenues in the client. And there's a whole uh, issue of, of uh, uh, consulting. Um, I must tell you, uh, we, do, we do it differently as South Africans. And they, they, the audit committees of listed companies are very strong on controlling this. But that's not the case uh, in the US and that's why they bring it as a big issue. But I do know even in South Africa, uh, a lot of people are not aware on how it's, it's, it's being controlled. So it continues to be, to be an issue. And, and, and that's why we have in the interest of saving the public interest, that's why we stopped. Now, here's another one that I've never heard before, which I picked up uh, recently from one of the American studies. And they say part of the lack of independence is because the records themselves that the auditor is auditing are being provided by management. So what are the chances that management is going to provide the records that it knows is gonna be caught on what they were doing. So if there are records that incriminate them, they will clearly make sure that uh, uh, it's not available to, to the auditors. However, I mean, uh, technology at this point in time, unless you bypass the system totally, is such that there's a, there's a footprint left uh, everywhere. The next point that they put is the lack of trans transparency. And here they say, you know, um, the AGM, the shareholders vote for the auditors every year. Now they think this is a mock vote. It, it, it actually shouldn't be done at all because the investor at that point in time at the AGM and in preparation for the AGM, they are not being given sufficient knowledge about the auditor that they are appointing to be able to exercise it uh, uh, legitimately or knowledgeably. They don't have access to the inspection records of the regulator. They don't have access to the inspection records of, 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 of the audit firm itself about this particular partner and about the performance of the firm in general. And yet you ask them to approve the vote. But in our system, as you know, that's been delegated to the audit committee. And the audit committee does ask and they do receive uh, those, those kind of records. And then lastly, they pick up uh, the lack of independent governance. Now, quickly, for those, some of you might not be familiar with how partnerships are being governed. And I'll try and give you a quick synopsis. You probably have a, you have a CEO 
You have a head of audit, head of advisory, head of people, head of marketing, head of this, head of this, head of that. That becomes your exco. Now, every member of exco runs some department, some division, some part of the business. Therefore, it means the rest of the partners, one way or the other, they report to one or one member of the exco. If you are in audit, you report your head of audit, directly or indirectly. If you're in uh, human resource, you report to head of uh, human resource. If you're in tax, you report to head of tax. So everybody else that's left in the partnership reports to somebody. Their career, their promotion, their increases is tied somehow to the head. Then what you do to the remaining partners, the partnership at large elects members from the partnership that are going to form the board, and this board is meant to oversee the exit. You see the problem there immediately. But that's been the model of partnerships from time immemorial. It's not a new thing. Okay? And that's what they talk about in terms of lack of independence, governance, because you are just, it's all incestuous. Now, coming quickly to what is being suggested, they believe or suggest that every five years, you need to give the investors full record about the auditor that they are voting for and the audit firm that they are voting for. Everything from all the, the company's inspection reports to the regulator's inspection records so that they can knowledgeably exercise their vote. There's another suggestion, and this is an old one, it didn't surprise me, even at the unrun time it came, that stock, stock exchanges or regulators should appoint and pay auditors so that the auditors should know who they really need to for. And they say uh, the system to collect money from all of these listed companies and put it in a port and and allocated uh, to different auditors. And they say, well, a percentage can be worked as to currently the audit fees, what percentage of turnover it is. And, you know, they come up with all sorts of permutations as to how it can be done. This, I, I, I know it was on the table, not only, not only in the US, but in the UK. But uh, at that time, the modalities of it was found uh, not to be practical. But it, I see now it's back on the table again. And then the, the, the other one was that uh, the, the regulators must give full report to the, invest, to, the, to the investors, including where they were lacking in governance, all the findings that the auditor uh, got uh, about the company. They must name the company. They must name the CEO. They must name the CFO. They must name the audit committee chair and all of that. So they, they propose it's going to be full disclosure. And then uh, I hope you can still see me. I think there's funny things happening on my screen here. We can still see you clearly, Good okay. All right. Thank you. And then um, they also suggest that the recycling of audit partners must stop. And what they mean by that, there's five years, a uh, partner must rotate and get off, and then uh, a next partner comes in for the next five years. Normally what happens is after five years, because there's now been five years pulling off, the previous partner comes back and they say that practice must stop. Once you rotate it off, you must never go back. Because the new partner that comes knows that you're coming back, so he doesn't want to expose anything that he might be finding, even though it came with fresh eyes. Because you know he's coming then, it's going to be his turn to expose you on whatever you might have missed. So they, 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 they say that kind of practice must be, must be brought uh, to, to, to an end. And then they also say uh, how audit firms are governed. The audit firm itself that's up for, for, for voting must uh, give a full briefing of how it is being governed. Now, that, that is uh, from, from the, the um, um, auditing, auditing point of view. There's been very many uh, 
uh, suggestions also to say that we need to, to look at comprehensive regulation. Where we look at regulation that includes looking after management, directors, audit committees, and auditors. Because this is a whole chain and you cannot only hold one party responsible, but the whole chain needs to be uh, managed uh, uh, appropriately. Um, you also mentioned SA2 about uh, the expectations of auditors, you know, that auditors, and, and they, in this study, they also lament about that, that auditors say, you know, we are not uh, watchdog. We are not uh, bloodhounds. We are blood. We are uh, watchdogs. What is it that is expected of an, of an auditor? And they recommend that segments of uh, forensic auditing should be included in the normal audit. And personally, I agree with that very much. But also, let me also tell you that it's beginning to happen. With all of the tools that the different firms have, there are many instances where 100% of populations are being audited. No matter how huge the volumes could be millions and millions of transactions per month. And with the tools that the auditors are bringing forth now, you're able to do a 100% audit and you review with those tools and you follow up uh, exceptions. So while the auditors might not have publicly admitted that guys, this expectation gets them and we, this is what we're doing to close it, it is gradually closing. Many, many, many of the accounts, revenue for instance, uh, in most instances, we are able to audit 100%. And we move in that direction, that's the way that audit is going, where you'd be able to audit 100% of of the transactions, they're, they're, thereby doing based on some kind of uh, uh, forensic uh, investigations. I think we need, in my view now, in conclusion, we need to listen more to what the public is saying. We need to seek to meet the expectation more and argue less and defend less. Because I think that is the only way that we're going to bring back the trust. That is the only way we're going to bring back the reputation that we need to endeavor to serve the public interest, which is to, pro to, to protect the investors and the communities from which our businesses come from, including the private sector. Thank you very much. I'll stop there and we'll, we'll engage in a question and answer later. Thank you so much, um, Wood Ignatius, for a, such a genuine and candid introspection of, of your own industry. Um, I think at the end, you mentioned um, listening more, seek to meet expectations more, arguing less and defending less and serving the public interest. And I think just in this engagement with yourself, um, that is exactly what you have done. Um, less of uh, defensiveness and really just a really genuine, honest and candid introspection about some of the issues that have faced the industry um, and, and what your assessment is, what regulators are saying and, and generally what, what, what an, an, an inward look into the industry over the past couple of years has brought about. Things like um, what is the orientation of auditors? How do they actually um, exercise the professional skepticism um, which they're supposed to exercise and, and and I guess in the kind of context where we were in 2017 and to an extent even today you might need to be less professional and more skeptical just because of, of the context and the environment that you find yourself in. Um, you also spoke about obviously the lack of independence that is perceived and, and then you, you propose some of the, 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 the reforms which could possibly assist with that. Okay, um, but Lazi, it's almost up to you now. Um, something that I just wanted to touch on and you're welcome to touch on it or not in your, in your speech, but you know, when these uh, organizations have faced crisis, 
um, maybe not so much Deloitte, but I think at, at a point with KPMG, something as the BMF, I mean, you've heard us um, shouting from the rooftops that we don't want black CEOs to go into state-owned enterprises um, just to be set up to fail, basically, to find an environment that is very hostile um, that, and be given mandates that are impossible to execute on, etc. So I just want to bring it into this sector as well. Um, something that we're watching closely as the BMF is we also don't want black CEOs to succumb to the glass cliff phenomenon where there is a crisis and now suddenly a black CEO is being brought in to almost restore the credibility or to fix the crisis. But in actual fact, they are being set up for failure because the situation is just such a crisis and it's not a crisis of their own doing. And, and, and their success or failure is really being evaluated on an impossible situation. So we're also watching that quite closely um, from a private sector. Um, and linked to that is this phenomenon of a corporate savior um, where black leaders really are put as tokens and experience tokenism and then really struggle um, to succeed because of just this intense level of scrutiny and being expected to really work miracles. Um, so, I mean, you're welcome to touch on it um, as it pertains to, to the auditing industry, but that's just something that I just wanted to mention that um, as the BMF, you've heard us speak very loudly about what happens in SOEs, but we see it sometimes in, in private sectors as well. So, Bukwazi, I'd also gone haywire with your CV, but I'm not going to be unfair to Ubud Ignatius, but one thing I will mention is that you are a former president of Avasa. So uh, I think that's a sister organization and we really share a lot in terms of the mandate and, and, and what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to guard against um, and, and what we're passionate about, which is really socioeconomic transformation and ensuring that for your purposes, you send chartered accountants into industries um, or black accountants into, into corporates and, and, and you, you kind of are very vigilant about how they experience these corporates, how they are treated, um, whether they're given opportunities to, to, to rise and they're not being set up for failure, etc. And from a black management forum perspective, obviously the, the range is just that much wider and more general than yourself. So I want you to speak then as the CEO of Deloitte Africa, but also as, as, as a former president of um, Abasa. So without further ado, uh, CEO and Mr. President, uh, Loazi Abam, please uh, come in, thanks. I said to thank you. Um, it's been a while since I last spoke at a BMF function, so it is, it is great to be invited back. Um, I have always spoken at a BMF function as, uh, as the CEO of Deloitte. I have not yet had an opportunity to talk as a former president or a current president um, of Abasa when I was the president. But you know, we've always worked very well with, um, with BMF as Abasa, so we appreciate that. Um, so in addressing this topic, my, my focus here is going to be on the audit profession and the audit product. Um, I'm happy for us to talk about broader issues uh, in the Q&A. Um, and in, in talking about it, there obviously will be certain areas that will overlap with what Ignatius has covered. Okay? But you know, the perspectives are different. We are different organizations. We are different firms. Uh, we've had different experiences. So where I would like to start, is to start to align or maybe you know, outline the case for the profession. So why is it important that uh, we have a, an audit product? Why do we need an audit product? Why is it important? So in starting with that align, alignment or outlining rather, alignment is the wrong term here, so an audit is important because it is an important contributor to building investor confidence and investor friendly environment. An investor friendly environment in turn is important or is key 
to the growth and the development of our country. So that's a starting point. So the success of this audit profession depends on being able to provide this service, this audit service in a reliable and credible manner. If the audit cannot be trusted, it loses its value and its worth. So the case that I'm making is that it does not serve the profession or any of the firms to be in a position where the reliability and the credibility of the profession is in doubt. It is in our interest, all of us in the profession, the individual firms, that this audit product is credible. So, and what happens is that when we have failures and whether those failures are as a direct result of actions or lack of actions by practitioners or failures that occur in entities that we audit, that does not contribute to a reliable or a credible audit product. So I guess the reason that we are, we are having this discussion tonight, as well as other parts of the world are having similar discussions, it is because there have been a number of corporate failures. And it's important to acknowledge that these corporate failures were, yes, there were a number in South Africa, but there've been several in other parts of the world. So the question I would imagine part of the reason why we're having this discussion is to get to the position of saying, how do we fix this? We need to be able to decipher what it is that we are fixing. Therefore, do we know what has gone wrong? When you try and, and summarize the discourse that's currently going on in the country as well as in the world, you would have heard some of these from, from what Ignatius has said. So when people talk about what has gone wrong, I have heard the profession has become greedy. I have heard that the professionals have become unethical. I have heard that clients, our clients have also become unethical. That auditors lack independence, that the current grouping of auditors are not adequately qualified. I've had suggestions that the audit product itself no longer meets the market needs, it's outdated. There are people who talk about part of the failure is caused by concentration of firms. You only have really the big four and, uh, and nothing else. So the answers to all these questions are important, but to get to, to, the, to the bottom of the issue, we need credible, adequate research. The risk that we face if we don't go to that in-depth research is that we shoot in the dark. And what I fear about that is that while it may seem to be the right thing to do to make immediate uh, solutions available to, to address the issues that the public is raising, to address the issues that the market is raising. What I fear about that is that if it proves not to be sustainable, if it proves not to be the right answers to the question, the impact and the backlash that will come to the profession would be even more severe than what we're dealing with now. So in addressing these issues, Ignatius uh, spoke quite a lot about what is happening in the US. It is important for, for us as a country to be able to build on what other geographies have done uh, to date. The US, 
What's interesting about what's happened to the US, so if you look at the last, let's call it five years, there have been significant corporate failures in all, in all the major jurisdictions except the US. And we need to understand what's unique about the US that has not led to, to failures in that geography. You have had failures in the UK, you've had failures in Germany. And I would like to focus on what the UK has done because the UK uh, in effect is a few steps ahead of us in terms in, ahead of many of the jurisdictions that are dealing with current issues. So I, I, have, I have chosen to focus uh, on what the, the UK is choosing as potential solutions, what the UK has identified as potential problems, because I believe those are in a, in a way more current. The reason why I believe that it is important that we build on what other geographies have done is because we participate in international markets. And as a, as a country, as a middle-sized country, we don't have the luxury as, as, uh, as Ignatius said earlier, where the US can almost ignore what the rest of the world is or that China can take a view that this is what we develop it. Because we are a middle-sized country, it is important that our solutions are generally aligned uh, to what is happening internationally. Or we must have very credible reasons for why we deviate. So this is what the UK has done. And, and just a bit of background around this, uh, in the UK, you've had several uh, investigations that have been done in the audit profession in the last three years, uh, including the Bryden Commission. Um, and that has now been taken and has been largely significantly, the Bryden Review, the, the outcomes of that have been significantly adopted by the UK government as a way of improving the trust in the profession as a way of improving the audit product. So this, the, they've identified a number of issues and they've suggested a number of solutions. So I'll go through some of them. This is not a comprehensive review because I'm keen that we get to an engagement. So I'm gonna try and summarize this. So one of the issues that has been identified and Ignatius also referred to this is the clarity on the responsibilities of all the parties that are involved in the value chain of corporate reporting. You have management, and this is, this is per the Bryden and now adopted by the UK government. You've got management who are primarily responsible for producing accurate and reliable financial information primarily responsible for that. You have directors, and this is both executive and non-executive directors that need to approve the financial statements, uh, approve that they are a true and fair reflection of what the performance was. And they approve and sign them before the auditors sign. You then have the role of the auditors which is they need to be independent. They need to provide reasonable assurance that those annual financial statements comply with accounting standards, that they are free of material uh, misstatements, including uh, material misstatements as a result of, of fraud. And they provide a, a, an opinion to that effect. You have a regulator who comes afterwards, as Ignatius was explaining, who then looks at, so you performed X amount of audits. The standards say, this is how an audit should be performed. How did you do? And gives a report uh, of the performance 
of of the of the audit tar and the audit firm. So that's the first issue they raised. There's also this whole discussion about the clarity on what an audit is. I mean, it sounds like a simple issue, but given the amount of different views that exist, what is an audit and what is it intended to deliver? So we understand that the, the audit opinion is primarily aimed at investors, both current as well as prospective investors. Okay, that's maybe the technical view, but we know that an audit opinion goes further than that because an audit opinion is actually consumed by a much broader group of people, a much broad, broader stakeholder base. Uh, and, and hence we talk about public interest when we talk about the audit. So it is important that we are clear and, 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 and come up with a statement that is unambiguous, that clearly st stipulates what an audit is and what it is expected to deliver. Yeah? And, and I will say this uh, to try and link it to what Ignatius was saying around the expectation gap. So there's been always this issue around the uh, the, the expectation gap, what are auditors expected to do relative to what the market uh, expects or the public expects. Biden, and I agree with this, says it, it is actually an irrelevant discussion. The key, the key question about what an audit does is whether an audit is helping to reinforce deserved confidence in the business or not, okay? And if it is not, you address it so that it is. So this issue around the expectation gap completely aligned, it is a non-issue as a discussion, but it is important that we come up with a statement that is unambiguous about what an audit is and what it is intended to deliver. When we talk about potential for improving what we have. The regulators in South Africa, as well as in other parts of the world, have determined that the current performance of auditors is not up to scratch. So this is in terms of their failure to apply and execute on audits as per current standards. Yeah, and when I say it's not up to scratch, it means there is room for improvement. And I want to be clear about this, there's room for improvement. It does not mean that the whole profession is, we're talking about a third of audits that do not meet the standard is generally the thing. So these are auditors who are ethical auditors that have not executed to the requisite standard. I personally believe that this is where you have an opportunity. This is where we all have an opportunity for quick wins because we need to understand what the actual issues are and address those issues that lead to auditors using current stand standards, not uh, delivering uh, pay expectations. That's separate from unethical auditors where you have instances of unethical auditors, those should be dealt with immediately. There's no, there, there's no debate around that. If you have issues of unethical auditors, those should be dealt with immediately. SA2, Ignatius also spoke about the need for auditors to become more skeptical, to provide more information, and they believe that is what uh, would lead to audits being trustworthy. So if we've now excluded the issue of auditors that are operating unethically, so they have uh, ulterior motives for not being skeptical, there's still a whole body of auditors that are ethical individuals who, according to the studies that have been done, uh, have not been able to exercise adequate skepticism. 
Now, in order to solve that, we need to understand what it is that leads uh, well-meaning auditors who are doing a great job for not being able to meet the standard of skepticism. Is it education? Is it financial in incentives that are, lead? is it the culture of the firms? We need to understand that in order for us not to shoot in the dark. There's a whole issue around the focus of auditors and the information that they focus on. Suggestions that we focus on too narrow and informations, we don't take into account what is happening in the market and let it influence our audit um, outcomes. Our opinion is only based on annual financial statements, not everything that happens in an entity. So is there an opportunity to broaden that? Now, everyone talks about the issue of fraud. And according to this UK uh, report, this was identified as the most complex and the most misunderstood topic in terms of responsibility and accountability, what the auditor does, what management and directors are responsible for. So what they've, what has always been understood is that directors have responsibility for safeguarding the assets of the company. They are expected to take reasonable steps to prevent and detect any material fraud. Auditors, they are, as part of their responsibility, they are responsible for providing reasonable assurance that the financial statements that they are opining on are free of any material misstatement, whether as a result of fraud or any other error. I'm repeating this. That's, a, that's the responsibility. And where fraud is suspected, they are then expected to raise it for those charged with government management board of directors to be able to investigate and deal with it. And only if they don't adequately address it, do they, the auditors have to report to their regulator. That's their responsibility. So those are the things that have come through the UK, you know, and, and we as a, as, as a South African uh, community need to take that build for what is uniquely South African, but we mustn't reinvent the wheel. Let's take what's there because a lot of what an audit is, is gonna be universal, whether it is performed in Germany or in South Africa. South Africa has other unique things that we need to build in, uh, but those are a top up on what the fundamentals are. So that's what we need to do. And there are a number of activities that are currently going on in the country that are meant to, uh, to address this. So National Treasury has uh, advised that they will form a, a, a team of people that would look into the audit profession. The audit profession itself has had engagements to understand what are the areas that we can change voluntarily without uh, needing the power of the legislation. What are the areas that we can change in South Africa uh, that don't need uh, international alignment. So those processes are going. I guess where we are as a profession, we recognize that the, there is a, there's been a, a failure in trust. There's been a significant um, devaluation of the profession and we need, and we have no choice. We have to fix it, okay? But in fixing it, we need to be steady and we need to be considered to make sure that what we fix is sustainable and we, it is something that we as a profession, as a country can live with uh, in the long term. So I'm gonna stop the uh, set of, with my opening remarks and, um, and open up uh, the conversation. Thanks um, very much, um, Lwazi. So um, I think 
you know, the combination of your two um, addresses um, was really complementary um, in that yours was focused on, firstly, you started saying, what is really the purpose of the profession? And what is the purpose of the audit product as such? And, and primarily it's used by investors and it gives confidence um, about, you know, the the, the economy, the companies within the economy, and actually contributes to the development of that, that economy and, and that country at large. You then also said that, well, besides that, there's also a much broader um, spectrum of users who, who use um, audit reports, and, and, and there, therein lies probably the expectation gap. But then you were quick to say that the UK has found that the expectation gap doesn't actually exist or is not an issue. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure um, about that, but you can you can just um, go back to that part about the, the lack of the expectation gap or how it's been found that it's not actually an issue. Um, then you said that you need we need an unambiguous statement about what an audit is and what is intended what it is intended to deliver. And and, and I assume that the profession um, is currently trying to come up with that unambiguous statement. But more importantly, I think you highlighted um, that there's actually other people in the value chain who are also responsible for, for, for the quality of the financial information that comes out. Um, and you broadly put it into three categories where management is primarily responsible for preparing the audit, um, the, the financial statements and ensuring that they are valid, accurate and complete. And then you've got the board of directors who actually signs off on those financials um, and ensuring that they are free from material misstatements and that they sort of fairly represent um, the, the, the status of the organization for which they have been charged with governance. And, and control of that entity, and then come the auditors. So I think it's very important to really, you know, highlight that value chain and, and understand that all of these three sort of um, uh, uh, pieces or, or individuals or groups of people have a responsibility for the final product. Um, and I think that will also go a long way in the so-called expectation gap, which you've said um, <laughs> there is no expectation gap. Um, okay, can I clarify this issue of the expectation gap? So yeah. it's not that there is no expectation gap. There is an expectation gap. But what, what I am saying and what, uh, in fact, what I agree with what the UK has said is that we can't hide behind that. The issue <laughs> is that there is a, we need to deliver a particular product that meets the needs. So if it isn't, you need to adjust, adjust what you need to adjust in order to meet the expectations. Oh, no problem. Thanks for that. Um, Ignatius, if you can just switch your camera back on, I am going to go to the questions and we can just have an engagement, um, I think, for about the next 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, to the participants, please do you continue posting um, questions either in the Q&A box or the chat box. I'm not going to be discriminatory <laughs> about where you post your questions. I will try and get to all the questions. Um, I think I'll take three at a time. Um, if there's one that's specific to you, I'll say so. But otherwise, I will just read the question and you can decide um, who takes which question. So the first one is, how is the leadership of firms taking new qualified auditors under their wing to enable them to raise issues that they identify and assure them of professional protection to do that? And that's from Clearly Marketa. Um, another one that actually spoke about this um, as I was reading through is some of the challenges I feel are that of a lack of capacity, incentivized audit performance, lack or ineffective whistleblower structure. So I think this, this also speaks to um, if people want to raise issues and, and so-called blow the whistle, do they feel adequately protected to do so? Then the third one that I will take as the first round, um, I think it's more of a comment than a question, is... Regulators globally select inspection files on a risk-based approach. Highest risk are chosen. Surely these files should be receiving the highest level of attention for quality control and should not fail any inspection by the regulator or any other review. If the high-risk files are failing, 
what does that mean for the system of quality management firm-wide? So that, those are the first three questions. I'll hand over to, to the both of you. Um, as I do, I'll take the, the first step and the, the first two questions are kind of similar to me. Um, you know, it is generally accepted that uh, people that speak up get uh, victimized and all of that. We work very hard uh, to ensure that everybody is free to speak their mind. And we give all sorts of guarantees to, to ensure that. And, and I always say, if anybody in the firm sees or hears me saying something that's not in line with our values, for instance, they need to be able to confront me. But if for whatever reason, they see me as a scary person and they think that'll be the end of their career, they welcome to go to prof, my chairman, they welcome to go to the risk partner, they welcome to, the, to go to the ethics officer, they welcome to go to any partner, but for heaven's sake, don't keep quiet. Including whether it's issues that you see on, on, on the audit. But over and above that, I notice that I will not get the firm overnight to be able to be confident, everyone in the firm to walk up to me and say, I disagree with you on this, or walk up to the engagement partner and say, I disagree with. That's the end game I hope we'll get there. But in the meantime, we provide many other instances where people are able to do so. Over and above being free to go see anybody, we do also have uh, the local hotline. We do also have the international hotline. We don't restrict you to only use the local hotline. You can use the international uh, hotline as well. And from time to time, we run uh, speak up campaigns. From time to time, we talk uh, through the, the, the business forum for the employees to try and, and engage. We, we are using all sorts of different channels to ensure that people do speak up and people are protected. And anybody that has anything come back to them, uh, are well, uh, I encourage to come and say so, because whoever and ensure that it goes back to that person would be dealt with because that is not in line with, uh, with, with, with how we work. And then, um, Oh, about the, the high-risk uh, um, audit files. Um, okay, let me address the, the high-risk audit files first. They shouldn't be failing. They shouldn't be. And where they fail, we need to, to, to understand what went wrong. And uh, that's why we have the root cause analysis. And going after the root cause analysis, then you do the, 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 remedial, the remedial action. And you also go check whether the remedial action has actually worked and addressed the, 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 the issue. I do wanna say though, that uh, it's not all the time that the high risk files are, are, are picked up. Um, my short experience, that's what I've seen is not always all the high risk files. But having said that, I repeat, in my, in my book, any high risk file that gets uh, picked up shouldn't fail. And whatever issues make it fail, you need to go back and, and fix it. From my limited experience on what I've seen, a lot of it though, relates to inadequate documentation. You find that this has been done and it's been discussed with that and whatever, but it was never documented anywhere. Or an issue like this uh, audit team has been on this audit for say three years. They've done a comprehensive review of some section or something in the first and second year, 
and they come in the third year, they check, nothing has changed, and therefore do not document what had happened in the past, but with the knowledge of what they know they've done in the past, con continue to conclude and move on, thereby making this particular year's uh, file not be able to stand on its own. So it's, it's mostly uh, issues like that, but it's no excuse because the standard says you need to document everything appropriately and your file needs to stand alone. So yes, it, it shouldn't fail. And no matter how one can view these as minor or serious or not, it shouldn't fail under any circumstance. And that's why we work very hard on the root cause analysis to ensure that such a thing doesn't happen. Um, just to build up on what uh, Ignatius has said, let, let me start with the, what, the first two questions, which are around culture, uh, the culture of speaking out. So the issue here is that one of the things that uh, is ingrained in each of us as professionals is that your, your ethics, your integrity are your own. You own them. So therefore, uh, that requires those individuals that witness or experience a lack of ethics or get exposed to unethical behavior. It requires them to be courageous. And I, I, I put that as an underlying thing. And I understand it is not easy. You are a first year trainee. You see something that feels uncomfortable and you worried about the impact on your profession and your career but it is ingrained on who you are as a professional. It is important that you do. The firm has got all these issues that Ignatius was talking about, uh, you know, hotlines, um, you know, statements that say what happens if uh, such uh, behavior is not dealt with. But at the core of it, it requires the individual that sees it and, and, and to, be, to be courageous. So it's important, it's ingrained in all of us as professionals. Uh, so I agree with what uh, Ignatius has said. And on the issue of, of uh, regulator inspections, the, the failure can be caused by a number of things. Failure of the individual uh, in, in judgment, okay, because I guess we are all working with a limited amount of time. You've got a set of facts that uh, you have to consider and you have to make a decision based on those set of facts that you have attained. Uh, it is possible for individuals to fail and make the wrong judgment. What is meant to prevent that is that the firm needs to have systems that are meant to catch that. And in some cases, those systems do not catch it. And we need to understand why those systems uh, do not catch it. And, and in each case, in each round of inspection, the, in the same way that in each round of audit, you identify internal control weaknesses, you recommend to the management, to the company, what they need to do to fix them. The regulators do the same with us to say, well, your, these systems of controls should have picked this issue, address it. That's generally my experience is that all the firms take that seriously and address the issue. But what remains to be uh, examined in my view is the link of the issues that have been identified as having failed by the regulator to corporate failures. Is there a direct link? Therefore, uh, in files or in audits where the regulator has pronounced that this audit was free of any material failures, does that guarantee that there will be no corporate failure? And uh, uh, in, the, in the other converse example, where 
the regulator has found that the file has not been, or the audit has not been executed per the standards, does that mean that the entity will fail? That link still needs to be examined uh, because in order for this thing to be fixed properly, you need to understand that value chain and how everyone contributes to the sustainability uh, of capital markets. Okay, I seem to have an issue getting my video back on, but I will I'll keep trying and I'll take the next round of questions. Um, okay, the host is asking me to turn on my video. I know I'm trying. <laughs> okay, next round of questions is um, the direct root cause for auditors is non-compliance with auditing standards. Why has this occurred? this one is specific, why has this occurred at KPMG considering the sizable investment in CPD? So good Ignatius, if you will take that one. Then uh, for come you- Come again, sorry, come again, uh, the direct root cause of? So it says that the direct root cause for auditors is non-compliance with auditing standards. I suppose the root cause for, for the issues. Why has this occurred at KPMG considering the sizable investment in CPD? Okay. Um, this one for Upudluazi, interesting to hear the UK and US studies. However, what is the reflection of the two CEOs on their own firms, uh, South African experience and root causes of poor audit quality? Then a third one, how have audit procedures changed or been adapted thus far to improve the robustness of the audit process, as well as issues like peer reviews. Thanks. I'm still struggling to switch on my video, but please go ahead. Um, I'll go first, as I too, I must say, I, I didn't get the, the last one. Um, I'll get you to repeat later. Um, you know, Let's try and put things into context a bit. Uh, you talk about non-compliance with auditing standards. Let's talk about the two uh, corporate failures that happened in KPMG, many being the, the Gupta audits uh, and also uh, the, the VBS. And let's just uh, dispense with VBS uh, very quickly, because that's, there was no audit failure there, nothing. The audit process and the audit team picked up all that what that needed to be to be picked up. So there was no audit failure. So people might have different ideas. I'm happy to engage further. Take it from me. No audit failure. The team did their work and picked up. They knew there was no money and they reported everything. So no audit failure. Um, let's go to the, uh, to, to, to the Gupta audits. When you go to the Gupta audits, that was an issue of being uh, no, um, uh, no skepticism, very trusting uh, of the client, when the client uh, gives these elaborate uh, explanations, there was a level of gullibility of just accepting and, and going on with it. And I think uh, we, I spoke earlier on about skepticism. We talk about it uh, all of the time. Uh, and I think people, now take it very seriously, and I, 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 I can't tell why at the time it wasn't, it wasn't taking any uh, uh, very seriously. It was just accepting, even in the wake of contrary evidence that was in the newspapers, that was being um, uh, dismissed as uh, just journalists uh, just peddling lies or whatever it is. But really, 
there was just a blind loyalty of sorts, whether you call it lack of independence or anything. So I would like to differ with the questioner who presupposes that uh, the, the training or CPD or whatever did not have the desired effect. Uh, I don't think that is, that is the case. My own personal view, you, you, may, you may choose to, uh, to disagree. And then the, the, the poor auditing quality, I spoke earlier on that from what I've seen, uh, and I've gone through uh, the inspections that have happened since I've been at, uh, at, uh, at KPMG. Mostly the issue is about documenting audit evidence. And we've spent a lot of time specifically doing CPD and training on that particular issue at KPMG, at KPMG because there's an issue that comes over and over again. Every, okay, those on, on, on almost every file that does not pass, an issue of documentation comes in. And we've spent a lot of time really going through documentation and we've even now built it in the methodology where it actually forces you and asks you about documentation to sit back and make sure that you make this file uh, uh, standalone. So from the experience I have now, the issue has been uh, 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 documentation that is not being on the file and we working very hard uh, uh, to address it. So the, the first question was specifically for Ignatius, but um, maybe to, to add to what he said. So the issue here, so the, the, the statement was the direct root cause is, um, is because of non-compliance to audit standards. Yeah. If that was the case, it would be simple. We would solve the issue. Um, so what we found is that it is not, it is not the issue. Uh, there is a much broader issue. And, and, and then building to the question around, uh, you focus on the UK, but what's been your reflection on your, on your own firm? So the, the issues are very similar. If you look at the, corp at the corporate failures, uh, in, in the UK where there's been investigations of audit failures. It is in mostly around fraud and the issue around fraud and what the responsibility of the auditor and what the responsibility of the directors, what should have been expected of them. And then if you take the case of Steinhoff, even more complicated where the, where the fraud happened in, in East Europe, you had a different set of auditors uh, to group auditors. What were the responsibilities of the group auditor? So I, these issues, in order for them to be solved, they need to be addressed in depth. Uh, it is very tempting for all of us to want to operate or the, at a headline level. This is, oh, of course they should have known. Of course, they were exposed, uh, you know, they were there forever, they should have seen the fraud. In cases where an auditor, where there's evidence that an auditor ignored vital information that led to fraud, there's no debate. That person should not be in the profession. But it is also important that for the viability of the profession, for the growth of the profession, that we actually do not hang people to dry for what is actually a systemic issue. We need to separate systemic issues from unethical behaviors. And where we've got systemic issues, we need to spend the time addressing the systemic issues, not only for that individual, but for actually the viability of the profession. We are already uh, in a situation where the number of registered auditors has not grown, in fact, is in decline. If we are to create an investor-friendly country, which is backed by solid, credible, reliable 
audit processes. You need an adequate number of auditors. As someone spoke about capacity. You need this profession to remain attractive. And the profession to remain attractive, yes, you need to deal with individual failures harshly, but you cannot blame systemic issues on individuals. And you need to separate that and address systemic issues separately. All right, thanks. Um, last round of questions. I'm aware that we're now about 20 minutes over time and I would like to thank the audience for staying with us as well as for the two CEOs for, uh, for indulging us. Um, the first one is from a South African perspective, what reforms are required from the Independent Regulatory Board of Auditors, ERBA, granted that it should preserve its independence? The last question, is there room for the regulator to disqualify a company from being audited that has failed in its own fiduciary duties? Of course, this along with the punishment that is meted out to the auditors. So yeah, I think I, let's just take those last two um, and then we will head for closure. Thank you. Um, Andrew, the... Then it's, it's difficult for the auditee to talk about the reforms that are needed for the auditor. In this case, the regulated uh, as to what the, the regulator needs to do. Though all what I'll tell you, because it serves the profession and the country well, is that you need a very strong and well-resourced regulator. For me, I can't emphasize that more. If you have a regulator that's not very strong, that's not very, very well, how do you expect them to regulate the profession very uh, uh, properly and effectively? It, it, it cannot be. I, my own humble opinion, since I've been around in this profession, I've yet to see a well-resourced regulator for this profession. That's my, my own humble opinion. The RBA, given the resources that it's provided to it right now, we're expecting miracles out of them. They need to be properly resourced. That's the first thing. Second thing, that will enable them to be a very strong regulator that restores uh, trust in the profession. We'll work together with a strong regulator to be able to restore the trust in the profession and serve the public trust. And, and I'm not too sure from what angle you're asking this question, but ladies and gentlemen, this, is, this issue of having a strong, well-resourced regulator is an issue of national interest. Our economy has been battered now by many things, least of all COVID, but by a lot of economic mismanagement that happened in this country. We as a country desperately need to grow this economy. And part of growing the economy is to make our capital markets attractive to investment. And you cannot attract investment if your regulator is not strong and if your regulator is not resourced. They're gonna say, oh, what's the, why should I put my money in an in economy where the, the audit profession doesn't have the appropriate regulation, the appropriate uh, reputation, and yet also the regulation is not strong. So for me, this is a, an issue of national interest. We have to have a strong, well-resourced uh, regulator. And then the regulator to disqualify a company from being uh, audited. You see, unfortunately, the auditor gets chosen by the company and it's got nothing to do with the regulator. It's not in the ambit or the mandate of the regulator. But let me also tell you something. Since I've been at KPMG, we've turned down four opportunities to be considered as auditors. One was a listed company, and we said no thanks, having done our homework. 
Two, it was a company listed on the uh, all tax and we walked away. And two were large uh, uh, private companies. The regulator cannot dictate to us who to accept and not to accept uh, as a client. Uh, it's unfair to put that on the regulator. They have a, a lot of mandate that they are unable to get to. So to add to that, in the state that they are under resources, they are, I think it's, it's, it's not right. But we as auditors need to be discerning. We need to be really using our risk management processes to be discerning as to who we want to be associated with. And I'm looking forward to a day, and I hope it happens in my lifetime, where company will be running around trying to find an auditor and nobody will be prepared to audit them. I'm looking forward to that, and I hope it happens in my lifetime. I, I've got nothing further to add. Uh, I think Ignatius has captured it so well. All right, thank you very much. Um, this brings us colleagues to um, the closure of what has been a wonderful, insightful, candid um, conversation where um, I really would like to appreciate Razi and all Ignatius for, for really just opening up and, and letting us in um, to, to, to what has been happening in the industry, to, to the challenges, to their own assessment um, internally of, of, of what could have gone wrong, what has slipped through the cracks, and more importantly, what needs to be done to restore confidence in, in what is really a glorious profession and, and, and one that should get back to being, um, being, being, being determined as being number, the number one profession in the world by the likes of the World Economic Forum. So thank you so, so much um, for that from the BMF. Um, I'd also like to thank VMF President, Mr. Andy Lenomlala for your opening remarks um, and just for your support um, a, 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 for, for, for all of these initiatives and, and these very important conversations. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the BMF board as well. And I can't not mention the, the colleagues who work in the BMF office uh, often behind the scenes, but really who handle these, these webinars and these engagements so professionally and so seamlessly. I'd like to thank our corporate sponsors, all the CEOs, executives, and managers who have joined us this evening, um, our colleagues at Abasa, and all BMF members. And if you're not a member of BMF, please go to our website and, and, and do join the BMF. Um, nothing further from me. It's been an absolute pleasure hosting you this evening. Um, and have a great evening further. Goodbye.